some definite changes from July. We've really cranked up that monsoon across the Great Basin area and lots of boundaries and moisture throughout the southeastern U.S. There's the surface map for this Wednesday afternoon. A meso high across West Texas. Temperatures in the 70s and 80s in that area. At this point, it's going through a convective minimum, so not much in the way of precip. But later on, we could see some development along these boundaries. The southeastern U.S., plenty of cells from Georgia into East Texas and a stationary front through the central Mississippi into Virginia and the Delmarva. In the western U.S., a strong cold front moving through the San Joaquin Valley, a rather deep low-pressure area across the deserts of Oregon and Washington, and that's helping to drive that monsoon pattern, bringing the moisture north into Utah and Nevada. Going further up to the north, We've got a data loss up there in Canada, so no station plots, but up there in the Northwest Territories, Yukon, a strong push of cold air coming out of that area. Temperatures unseasonably low, probably about 20 degrees below normal. The core of that cold air right there in the northern part of the Northwest Territories, so we should see that spread into central Canada in the next couple of days. In the central Canadian prairies, that's the outgoing polar air spreading into the northern U.S. So this is lining up right behind it. And we'll check the surface progs and see what that's going to do a little bit later. And just checking very quickly up there in the northern Canadian region. Not much going on. Looks very typical for this time of year. Temperatures probably in the 40s and 50s. And dropping back to the northeastern U.S., you can see that they're in a pretty stout cold air advection pattern. Some of those boundaries ending up in the southeastern and central states. And that brings us around back where we started. Here's a look around the country at the maximum temperatures. Quite a distinction in the northeastern U.S. between cool air up in Canada and hot air in the east coast. Looks like 96 around Boston, 95 around New York. I think that's 101 around Newark and 97 at Washington, D.C. But further up to the north, looks like 75 around Buffalo, 67 at Montreal, and 70 at Toronto. There was certainly some hot weather in North Carolina. Looks like 97 right there. I think that's around Raleigh. I'm not too familiar with the cities in the Carolinas. But as we drop further south, we get into that precipitation field upper 80s and lower 90s, and then dropping into Florida, 97, that's probably about the hottest that I'm seeing there at Jacksonville, the rest of the state, in lower 90s and upper 80s. And for Texas, that hot weather does persist. There's the 100-degree isotherm covering much of the DFW area, Lawton, Wichita Falls, down to Waco, Austin, and San Antonio, the hottest reading guess that's going to be the Woodlands or Huntsville 104. Yep, that's quite hot. The rest of the region, mostly 90s. The north-central U.S., definitely plenty of heat on the high plains around Rapid City. Also around Denver, 95. But as you go up into the Great Lakes area, very comfortable 70s and 80s. That's that cold air mass that's spreading through that area. In the northwestern U.S., still quite hot in the interior deserts. Got 100 degrees around Pendleton, Pasco, and looks like around Missoula, hundreds showing up as well. In the southwestern U.S., a few hot spots such as Salt Lake City, 99, and there's even a 103 north of Ogden. Elsewhere, Temperatures look rather seasonal, 101 around Vegas. That's about what we would expect this time of year, 97, or I think 99 there at Phoenix, and 98 at Tucson. So hopefully we covered everybody's favorite area. Going region by region, it does take a while. We spent two and a half minutes doing those max temperatures just now. So we got to keep things moving along. Looking at the national view, this is what we're expecting for this afternoon, 96 
at Lander, Wyoming. That will tie the record for the date. For tomorrow, those temperatures will come up in Denver, close to records, 96 there, and some warm readings down in southern Florida and south Texas. For Friday, continued hot in the North Plains, 100 at Scotts Bluff, and some warm readings continuing to show up in Florida. More of the same for the High Plains for Saturday. For Sunday, we back off from some of those extremes. On Monday, a little bit warm in the Texas Panhandle. The rest of the country, typical August weather. And a similar situation for Tuesday. Most of today's weather around the country will be dominated by convection. We start out with a satellite loop at the very beginning, not very much new convection, a few anvils out there around Shreveport. But as we go forward about an hour, you can see things really blew up there, south of Dallas, out around San Angelo, and out near Longview. So we're going to see more of that as the day goes on. And the sea breeze may also get going. Don't really see that on the satellite loop. I guess that could be it right there. Normally it's a little bit further inland at this time of the day, but uh, we'll watch for that over the next couple of hours in Texas. In the southwestern U.S., it's also a little bit early in the convective day, but starting to see those buildups on the Mogollon Rim and out around Kingman, and with extensive precipitable water, especially in Nevada and Utah, numerous storms in a few hours in that region as well. The water vapor imagery showing the moisture field and the moisture flux as well. There it is, the monsoon coming up from Arizona into Nevada and Utah. Also some dry air working into Colorado and the central plains. And there's some of the SPC diagnostics showing the precipitable water. The highest amounts sat around Yuma and the Gulf of California, obviously the Gulf of California involved to a certain extent, but there's the access right up through Las Vegas and into northeastern Nevada and some very high amounts as far as eastern Washington. So we're probably going to be seeing precipitation potential developing in that area and continuing through the weekend. Also some very high amounts in East Texas, all the way back to Tennessee and down to the Central Gulf Coast. That's helping to support the extensive convection we're seeing in that area this afternoon. And some high amounts from Ohio out to Virginia and Maryland. And that's along that frontal boundary. I should say that's a quasi-stationary front through that area. Here comes the next front. And of course, we've got that other one lined up up there in the Northwest Territories. There's the 300 millibar field up near 30,000 feet. This is the key to everything. Prevailing westerlies confined to the west coast and the far northern states. Minnesota, the Great Lakes area, New York. The rest of the country under light and variable flow. The high pressure area centered over Cheyenne, Wyoming. Deep southerly flow helping to transport that deep moisture northward into the Great Basin area. We can take a look at that moisture in the vertical using weather nerds. Let's go into cross-section mode. We're looking at dew point, the red values indicating high moisture quantities. So we're going to go from the Gulf of California up into Washington. Now what we end up with is relative humidity, which is not really good for monitoring the moisture supply. This is mostly going to indicate where there's clouds. So A, that's going to be the Gulf of California. We go north. There's the Great Basin area, and there's Washington. So yeah, this is reflecting a lot of cloud material. The bunching of these isentropes right here, that's indicating a slightly more stable layer. So you may get some stratified clouds developing right here. That would be around 600 millibars, about 14,000 feet. So that explains some of the out cumulus that you get that persist overnight. So we need to get one of these other fields to really 
sample the moisture. So what are we going to pick? I don't think any of these really work. We, we really need to be looking at mixing ratio or dew point. And a lot of these sites just don't supply that. Uh, dew point, I don't think that's going to work. Or will it? No, that just gives us RH again. So we can't really visualize the moisture coming north. And that's one of the limitations we have on a lot of these weather sites. But using point and click models, yeah, we can see that. There's eastern Nevada. There's the elevated dew point readings tapering off into sub-freezing dew points up above 15,000 feet. This is showing that the bulk of the moisture concentrated in the lowest two or three kilometers. There's another example, significant moisture. I think that was northern Arizona. Quite a bit of it all the way up to 10,000 feet and then tapering with height. And when these green lines lean pretty far over to, to the left, kind of like that, leaving you a dry air in the mid-levels, that can give you high decapes and help augment microbursts and downbursts. So this sounding right here, not really conducive to that, but if that green line was further over in the mid-levels and upper levels, that would indicate the potential to transport dry air down to the surface and give us microburst potential. Now another way you can get that, let me click on the Ajo area, is an inverted V sounding. So that's kind of like an upside down V right there. Lots of dry air in the lower levels and plenty of moisture and instability in the mid-levels. And with that setup, you have lots of warm air here. You bring this cold downdraft into that. It is much denser than the air around it, so it tends to accelerate down to the ground. And that's another way you can get microbursts and strong downbursts. And there's a visualization of a downburst. Basically a downdraft plume accelerating down towards the surface. And you've probably seen this visually with some of those rain foots, that kind of thing. You get that curl as it diverges and bows out from the center. There's another example right there. So this is a paper from Wakimoto showing an inverted V. So the sounding, let me do this correctly. So you'd have a green line right there, the red line on the sounding looking like that. So you start out with that, you have the precipitation take place up in the storm, and the downdraft comes down, and the temperature properties, that's going to be the blue line. So it is colder than the air around it. And that gives you that negative buoyancy right there. You add that up, and that essentially gives you your decape. Some of that outflow can be quite prominent on radar. This is one example from about 10 years ago. Major outflow boundary extending about 10 miles away from these storms. There's another example. Instead of showing a fine line, well, it does show a little bit of a fine line right there. But the main thing that we see is a transition between a lot of scatterers out in the moist air and very few in the outflow air. So you would see that clear air kind of surging into this denser stuff and kind of eroding it. Sometimes we can see it on velocity. Looking at the reflectivity, that's it right there. You can see the change in the textures. But in the velocity, there's a change in the coloring, the change in the sign. So we go from inflow air right here to outflow indicated right there, the radar located at that red spot. So if we're sampling that, this area is moving away from the radar and this is moving towards the radar. And of course the other dual pole products, spectrum width, revealing that outflow boundary, and correlation coefficient, at least I think that's what that is. I didn't take notes, but I think that's the correlation coefficient field also showing a distinction between non-outflow air and outflow air. We can see it on satellite as well. This is an old school example showing old imagery from 1986, but yeah, that's outflow right there. 
Here's an example of numerous outflow boundaries. And here's a look at today's radar right now, south of Dallas. That's definitely an outflow right there. But as you get further away from the radar, 30, 40 miles, it does get harder to pick those up because you're usually overshooting the outflow. That could be some right there. You can animate it to see what it does. Yeah, that is pushing away from the storm cluster. So these are outflow dominant storms. But further to the south, this is too far away. The antenna is about eight or 9,000 feet up. There's no way you're gonna pick up outflow out of these. You need to get a radar site that's closer. And except for Fort Hood, I don't think we have any radar sites at all in that area. And a quick check of NHC. Not really anything, one little wave possibly coming together, but it uh, looks like we're still looking at another one or two weeks of clear sailing as far as hurricanes and tropical storms. And that'll do it for this Wednesday edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank Bill Peterson and Brian Hagerty for the increased pledge. That is uh, very much appreciated. I'm going to leave you with some footage taken between Hondo and Uvalde, Texas. Thank you very much to Greg for the footage. We'll see you all back here on Friday for another edition of Forecast Lab. Take care. Bye-bye.